Hey everybody, Danny Roddy. Thank you for clicking last video. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. Uh, it's, it's only been a few weeks, but the overwhelming amount of support for the content is really melting my ice cold heart. So I sincerely appreciate it. Today, I wanted to talk about the baldness field or the classic horseshoe shape of so-called male pattern baldness. So I didn't touch this idea in 2013 when I wrote Hair Like a Fox because I literally had no idea why it happened. People would ask me all the time and I would give kind of loosey-goosey answers of why I thought that might happen, but I definitely didn't want to put it in writing and that's why I didn't put it in the book because I didn't want it to haunt me later on. But having said that, I think I have some ideas of why that shape occurs that way and I think it ties in perfectly to the metabolic stress angle of male pattern baldness but uh, anyways, let's go through a couple of bullet points. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible because the growth factors and promoters and inhibitors of hair growth can just get so complex so quickly. And I think that's kind of part of the problem of a lot of hair loss researchers or independent researchers that are trying to figure it out. The first requirement I think for uh, to set somebody up for the metabolic state required for baldness, I think would be an interference and the systemic regulation of energy. And another way of saying that is just to uh, suppress the person's thyroid function and to see how they adapted with more cortisol or more prolactin. And of course, uh, prolactin and estrogen can go up just from environmental factors. So if you don't get enough light or you don't eat enough calcium, it, things like that. But I think that is the requirement to get somebody in that metabolic state for baldness and uh, that's that is the first domino that needs to fall and the second uh, a result of that interference in systemic energy regulation is the reduction in peripheral blood flow to the extremities so things like the hands the feet uh, the scalp and if you say that in a baldness forum or, or somewhere you might get laughed out of there or made fun of or whatever but it is I remember hearing that and thinking that it's, I was pretty skeptical and then when I actually read the research it was like so obvious that this was part of male pattern baldness uh, reduction in the peripheral blood flow. And a paper that I think really encapsulated uh, the whole idea is 1996 Goldman et al. Uh, paper and I wanted to read a little bit from that. So they say, we postulate that because of the underlying anatomy there is a relative microvascular insufficiency to regions of the scalp that lose hair in male pattern baldness, and that is associated with local tissue hypoxia in those regions. The vascular supply of the scalp is derived from branches of the internal carotid artery and branches off in the external carotid artery. The frontal region of the scalp, which loses hair in male pattern baldness, is supplied by the supraorbital and supratrocular arteries. These are relatively small branches of the internal carotid artery system. The temporal sides and occipital back of head regions of the scalp, which do not lose hair in male pattern baldness, are supplied by larger branches of the external carotid artery. Specifically, these are the superficial temporal, posterior, auricular, and occipital arteries. Further, the frontal and vertex regions of the scalps overlie the galea aponeurotica, which is relatively avascular. The temporal and occipital regions of the scalp overlie the temporalis and occipitalis muscles which provide a rich network of musculotaneous perforator blood vessels. These anatomic differences contribute to the tenuous nature of the dermal blood supply to the frontal and crown regions of the scalp. So I'd encourage anybody to read this paper. You can find the abstract obviously, obviously on PubMed or you can go to Sci-Hub and read the, the full text. Uh, just to add on to this, the, this was a paper I think referenced in the Goldman paper and they said, a reduced nutritive blood flow to the hair follicles might be a significant event in the pathogenesis of early male pattern baldness. And then oddly enough in 2002, I forgot how I stumbled upon this paper, but it was a surgeon talking about reconstructing the galea and he was talking about surgery, but then he just kind of went into a tangent on how reduced blood flow was an obvious feature of male pattern baldness. And he says, the belief that the scalp has a super abundant blood supply and consequently is very forgiving of surgical indiscretions may need to be reconsidered. And so I, th I always thought that was funny how I accidentally stumbled upon that 
paper. So uh, systemic interference in the regulation of energy, how that person specifically adapts to the situation with the hormones they adapt with, how the liver functions in that adaptation, the individual's history in development, prenatally, childhood, every situation that's happened in that person's life, these are all factors in the development of male pattern baldness. And so uh, that leads to the reduction of peripheral blood supply, and then that leads to hypoxia in the scalp. And so uh, the, uh, like the hypoxia is also amplified by things like estrogen and nitric oxide, and these activate mast cells. And so let's talk about what mast cells are because that can actually is kind of an issue in and of itself. And so I actually wanted to get uh, Ray Pete's idea of what they were because I thought they, they might be kind of important. So I asked him, I think about a year or two ago, and this was his reply to me. And he said, following my understanding of the implantation process of an embryo in the uterus and the functions of mast cells there leading to the formation of the placenta, I'm inclined to think of them as potential agents of tissue renewal or regeneration. I think their action, activation by estrogen and quieting by progesterone suggests that they are probably activators and guides for stem cell formation and differentiation depending on the availability of support. Their presence in cancers have always seemed to me to indicate that both allergies and cancer are mainly systemic energy problems. And so the hypoxia causes an accumulation of mast cells. And here are some quotes to back up that. Uh, the results suggest that mast cell stimulation occurs only when PO2 is reduced and support the idea of a mediator that is released during systemic hypoxia and initiates the inflammatory cascade. And then the role of mast cells in male pattern baldness is unknown, but the large numbers often present is a striking feature. And so you have the mast cells accumulating in an inflamed area, a hypoxic area. And according to Ray Pete, this is, uh, or the mast cells function is to regenerate based on uh, what's available and the, the support. So if you think back to a Moretti paper, I linked it in a previous article, but they talk about how mast cells are a normal part of hair growth. And I think in the first stages of antigen, they accumulate and then they taper off through the rest of the antigen growth cycle, but they are needed for like the, the initial uh, glycolytic an uh, antigen growth phase of the hair cycle. And so if the scalp is, attempting to kind of regenerate itself, you can think that uh, depending on the availability and support, something that would inhibit this entire process is the accumulation of fatty, uh, unsaturated fatty acids in the tissues and they would amplify this uh, inflammatory hypoxic situation. So I, I'm gonna sound like I'm being a dead horse, but the prostaglandin D2, which we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, mast cells are producers of prostaglandin D D2. So in peripheral tissues, prostaglandin D2 is produced mainly by mast cells. And then tying all of the ideas together, this uh, reduction in systemic energy, reduced peripheral blood flow and delivery of glucose, oxygen, nutrients, uh, hypoxia, accumulation and activation of mast cells. And then the mast cells, depending on the person's composition of fatty acids, is producing inflammatory prostaglandins. And then this is shaping the horseshoe shape of male, male pattern boldness. So we hypothesize that this difference in pattern of prostaglandin D synthase expression may constitute a developmental pattern inherent to normal as well as alopecia scalp skin, thus defining a field vulnerable to acquired hair loss. These data indicate that the scalp is spatially programmed via mast cell prostaglandin D synthase distribution in a manner reminiscent of pattern uh, seen in androgenic alopecia. Currently, the main successful treatment options for androgenic alopecia are finasteride, an androgen-based systemic therapy with numerous side effects. <laughs> uh, in a prior study of male pattern alopecia, Increased numbers of mast cells have been seen in the balding vertices compared to non-balding occipital scalp. And in fact, this pattern was also observed in five control subjects studied, though uh, there were greater numbers, numbers of mast cells in patients with alopecia. In the 1990s, mast cells were found to be activating, actively degranulating in inflammatory infiltrates 
of the scalp with male pattern alopecia, and this was proposed to contribute to parafollicular fibrosis. So these inflammatory things are changing the scalp, and so the typical fibrosis, uh, the edema of the hair follicle, there's also accumulation of mucopolysaccharides, uh, thinner scalp skin, and the dissolution of the subcutaneous scalp fat. So these are all things that are changing the actual scalp because of the reoccurrent inflammation. And uh, often people say telogen is the resting phase of the hair follicle. And the, the prominent main feature of so-called male pattern baldness is a higher proportion of telogen hairs to antigen hairs. And that causes the lack of hair growth, obviously. And one paper described telogen is not as a resting phase, but a pre-regenerative phase uh, after the hair follicle being damaged. And so that would actually, I think, perfectly fit with the evidence that the scalp is uh, en enduring chronic inflammation and it's changing the way the hair grows and it's inhibiting it. So that is my explanation. It goes so much deeper than that. The hair follicle produces its own growth inhibiting hormones like estrogen, cortisol, prolactin, uh, as well as the person producing their systemic hormones. So it gets incredibly complicated, but I want to kind of stop right there. And I think anybody watching might get a general idea of uh, what's suggestive of causing that problem. So thank you guys so much for watching. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, ask any comments or constructive criticisms down below. Hit that like button. It's, it's so helpful and it means a lot and it encourages me to continue doing these if people actually enjoy watching them. So again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for liking. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for commenting. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.